use all my strength. I'll like crank the mainsail up. Steve and I have been building racing and cruising boats for most of our lives. We've had the opportunity along the way to do some voyaging, meet lots of interesting people, and pick the brains of experienced sailors in all parts of the world. That's what led to our new book, Offshore Cruising Encyclopedia. It's a compendium of information we've gathered about what works and what doesn't in the real world of cruising. Whether you're equipping an existing boat or looking for a new one, to make the correct decisions, you need first-hand cruising experience. But most people don't have the time before they head out to do much sailing, so the learning curve after you've left can be pretty steep. That's why Steve and I have made this video, to show you how many of the design, rigging, and equipment issues work when you're offshore. Sundeer represents for us the ultimate expression of an efficient cruiser. She's easy for us to handle and very simple to maintain. The same approach to rigging, systems, and seamanship which allow us to handle her so easily will also work for you. We're going to show you how we handle Sundeer 67 feet without roller furling, under power and sail, in light airs, and in storm force winds. We'll be discussing the deck layout that makes this feasible, as well as showing you through the engine room and interior. In the end, we'll take you to the drawing board to explain just what makes Sundeer such a well-behaved vessel. Sundeer is set up like a single-hander. Everything we have to do to sail her can be done by one person. An essential part of this equation is the use of full battens and lazy jacks. As you can see, we have electric winches to help with hoisting. These are not essential, but they do make day sailing easier. Cost-wise, they're about an even trade for roller furling, which we do without. Linda's closing the halyard jammer to transfer the load from the electric primary to the mizzenmast winch. Once that's done, she'll open the jammer so the tension goes directly onto the mast winch. This saves the halyard from jammer wear. Both mizzen and mainsail booms are quite low. That makes undoing the gaskets now and furling later on a lot easier. It also lowers the center of effort in the sail as well as helping stability by getting the boom and sail weight close to the waterline. Watch how quickly the leech of the mainsail comes clear to the lazy jacks. By the time the first quarter of the sail is hoisted, we no longer have to worry about the sail getting caught. Our working jib is attached to the headstay with old-fashioned piston hanks. They make changing a head so when it's blowing hard something we can deal with. 
The sail is stowed in the self-draining foredeck well. Hoisting and putting it away later are very quick, and we don't have to worry about the extra weight and windage aloft of a roller furled sail. Just touch more. It's good. The main and mizzen contain over 70% of our sail area. That leaves us with just a 600-foot working jib. Having so much of the sail area in boom sails makes the rig easier to handle and a lot more efficient. The jib is heavily built, so we rarely have to change down in headsails when we're offshore. Yet our performance in these light airs is quite acceptable. With this small jib, we're averaging six knots right now and seven knots of breeze. We start the lazy jack pennants about one third of the way up the mast, in this case where the lower shrouds intersect. The line begins at the end of the boom, then runs through a block at the pennant, and under the midpoint of the boom. The line then goes back up to the pennant on the port side, and aft to a block at the boom end. The final leg is to a metal clam cleat at the front end. This gives us a single line adjustment for both sides. You can get a better overall view of the lazy jacks here. When the time comes to get rid of the jib, if it's light, we'll head up into the wind for a quick luff. Or if it's blowing hard, run off and drop it in the lee of the mainsail. This is what we call horizontal roller furling. This same system of flaking and rolling will work when you stow the jib at deck level too. The forward 16 feet of Sundeer's hull is devoted to stowage. Our sails are carried in bins, so we don't have to lift heavy sail bags. On the starboard side, you can see the mizzen genoa and spinnaker along with the inflatable. To port are the main spinnaker and big reacher. Way up forward, under the jib well, we keep awnings, our storm canvas, fenders, and extra baskets. There's a watertight bulkhead between the forepeak and living quarters. Not only is this a safety feature, but it isolates the dampness and odor common to wet sails and ground tackle. There's gear stowed above the bins and against the hull sides, too. Our reaching jib is rolled around a loose piece of 1 by 19 wire and hoisted on the spinnaker halyard directly from the sail bin. When it's about two-thirds of the way up, Steve takes the tack forward to the roller drum, using a fast pin to make the tack connection.
From here on out, this works like a normally roller furled sail, except when we're done with it, we stow it, reducing windage and weight aloft. In these light airs, the extra sail area helps. Sundeer is reaching at wind speed eight and a half knots. We're going to run off a bit now and show you how we set the working jib on the pole. The four guy, which is adjusted from the cockpit, is attached first. Then the sheets run through the pole end and finally the topping lifts attached. Okay, now we got the four guy topping lift. While Steve shoves the pole forward, I push it outboard. The topping lift does the heavy work for me. Pole's under control. 65 pounds and 23 feet, it's that easy. We're not going to set any speed records today with this rig, but when combined with the main and mizzen, there's enough drive to keep us moving at an acceptable clip. And it has the advantage of being easily shortened down if a squall appears. You may be surprised to learn that most cruising takes place in pretty light airs, so powering capabilities are not to be overlooked. When set up right, sailboats can motor very efficiently. The key is correctly matching engine, reduction gear, and propeller. It's not unusual to take a while to get it right, but when you do, you can power as well as most trawlers. At some point, you'll want to experiment to find out your range in different conditions. 
Sundeer will power for 2,000 miles at 10 knots in light airs. If there's a breeze to help us motor sail, range will jump by 30 percent. You've probably noticed Sundeer doesn't give much waterline length away to overhangs. That's a big advantage when she's powering as well as sailing. Cutting speed back to 8 knots increases range by another 25 percent. But when the wind is on the nose, drag goes up and so does fuel consumption. We're heading into 30 knots of wind here with a 3-foot sea trying to hold us back. In these conditions, we'll burn about 3.5 gallons an hour at 9.5 knots and our range drops to 1,600 miles. For every set of sea conditions, there's an optimum powering speed. Right now, Sundeer is very happy at 9.5 knots. But if we were to slow her down to 7.5 or 8, she'd start to pitch a bit. Finding the best speed for motoring upwind takes experimentation. What we've usually found is that as the wave period shortens, we're better off speeding up. But with longer period ocean swells, it often pays to slow down just a bit. Sometimes 100 RPMs in one direction or the other can make a world of difference in comfort. We seem to do a lot of passaging with the wind right on the nose. When the breeze gets up over 17 knots, if we're making a long trip, we'll motor sail with a reefed main. Keeping the wind at about 15 degrees just fills the main and provides a surprising amount of drive. With this approach, we can handle up to 35 or 40 knots on the nose and still make good progress. Even with big seas like these, Sundeer keeps us reasonably comfortable. To be really successful, you need to be able to get the mainsail board flat. Lots of stiff, full-length battens help to keep the sail from luffing. The combination of long range under power and the ability to make good progress straight uphill allows us some unusual offshore cruising opportunities. Like the time we brought Sundeer straight back from the Marquesas Islands to Los Angeles against the Northeast Trades in just 17 days. Don't sell powering capabilities short. There are lots of areas where the ability to maintain a schedule opens up new cruising vistas. Like the incomparable Tracy Arm in Alaska. Sundeer's heavily framed and plated aluminum hull adds to our cruising flexibility and security. The bottom is 5 16ths of an inch thick. Frames are at roughly 3 foot centers with longitudinals at 10 inches on center. The hull is designed to withstand the impact of debris a lot more solid than water. And if the hull integrity is ever breached, four and a half watertight bulkheads contain the leak. Either end of the boat can be flooded without seriously affecting trim. Between those bulkheads, Sundeer's bottom is almost totally made up of fuel and water tanks. This gives her, in effect, a double bottom, another safety feature. You can see here how the tank side is welded to the hull. The keel is welded too, so there are no keel bolts to leak. These massive aluminum floors spread the load of the keel when we're aground or during impact. To keep the interior at an even temperature in cold or tropical climates, we have three inches of polyurethane foam sprayed along the hull side and decks.
That's where we are, folks. Scenery Cove. Scenery Creek. While we're in Alaska, we might as well talk a bit about ground tackle. Alaska is probably the most challenging spot to anchor we've ever cruised. Many of the anchorages are deep with lots of rock on the bottom. Our philosophy is to carry the biggest anchor possible, in this case, a 167-pound Bruce. Sure, it's a monster, but the extra 60 or 70 pounds is a fraction of Sundeer's displacement, and not much of an increase in the weight of our ground tackle package as a whole. Yet it makes a huge difference with holding power. On the other hand, we keep the chain light. Ours is a very high strength Schedule 7, 3 8 inch link. This is stronger than conventional half inch, but less than half the weight. We carry 240 feet of chain, enough to anchor in 120 feet of water with our big Bruce, if the holding's reasonable. Of course, we have three backup anchors and 900 feet of nylon road, just in case. But in all our anchoring on Sundeer, the Bruce hasn't yet required help. With all the cold weather cruising we've been doing, perhaps you'd like to come below and get warm. We like to keep the interior design colors neutral, using artwork and bright pillows for accents. This makes it easy to change decor if we get tired of the old look. The sculpted design on the seat cushions and backs is very comfortable, especially when we're healed. The nav station also doubles as an office. The whole side lockers have lots of space for all the nav gear, files, and supplies that seem to be required. The shelves were made at a local plastic shop. They're easy to do and provide specialized storage very efficiently. Electronics are installed so they're handy to use and can be quickly removed for service. They have extra long wire harnesses allowing easy access for repairs. With this approach you can update gear without having to find a carpenter. There are dual pole circuit breakers for each piece of gear aboard. The panel looks complicated but it's actually quite easy to use and greatly simplifies maintenance. The galley's laid out so I can brace myself on either tack when we're sailing, and I can use the stove without standing in front of it. The horizontally hinged lockers allow me to have both hands free when I'm working. The storage space is designed to reduce rattles when we're sailing off the wind. Glasses are hung from plastic shelving. The fridge and freezer are located amidships, which makes them easier to use. With six inches of insulation and large built-in eutectic plates, this seven cubic foot freezer will hold over for five or more days. The 14 cubic foot fridge faces aft so it can be opened on either tack without worrying about spilling the contents. The waterline level of the boat hits just about here. Now all of our payload, our stores, our tankage is down lower than this waterline level with their weight adding to the stability of the boat. A big chunk of that payload is right here, below the floorboards, which are locked in place with this simple door latch mechanism. The fact that Sundeer carries 85% of her 15,000 pound payload below the center of gravity has an enormous impact on our comfort and stability.
our 1,300 pounds of batteries are low enough to be considered part of the ballast package. The master cabin is located forward of the salon. We found this to be the best ventilated area in the boat and the quietest when we're under power. At anchor, we can hear the chain grumble if we start to drag. The fiddle rails on top of the lockers make excellent hand holds when we're on starboard tack. There's a combined head and bath compartment. The seat simplifies taking a shower when we're at sea. Or you can take a bath for less than 10 gallons of water. The towel rack, which doubles as a handhold, is plumbed into the heating system. This keeps the head warm and dries towels at the same time. The furniture has generously rounded corners. This looks nice and is a safety feature offshore. Another safety feature are the non-skid strips on the varnished cabin soles. These are made with ground walnut shells which match the teak color. Aft, there are two guest cabins. Using mirrors on the back and center line bulkhead opens the space visually. The guest head also doubles as the laundry room. This Maytag twin tub washing machine is ideal for cruising. It's easy to repair and you can do a week's wash for less than 12 gallons of water. They aren't made anymore, but you can find them used. Screens are built right into the overhead. They slide easily into place and storage problems are eliminated. At night, when you want soft illumination for ambiance, Try using low voltage lights. We use 32 volt bulbs in our 24 volt system. These blinds are one of the prettiest window treatment features I've ever seen on a boat. You don't even know they're there until at night when you want to use them and then they have this indirect light shining down them and they're nice and soft and kind of glowy. I just think they're beautiful. I love these. rattle around when you're sailing either. Over the years, we found the spinnaker to be one of our most valuable cruising sails. In many cases, it's actually easier to use than twin jibs. And when you're reaching or running in light airs, it'll steady the boat down, making the ride much smoother. If you reach up a bit from a dead run, the increased speed that comes with the chute will pull apparent wind forward, improving ventilation. This may not seem like a big deal now, but in the trades, when it's hot, it can make a world of difference in comfort. There's no reason to be afraid of the spinnaker. If the sail is cut right and you've rigged the pole correctly, it has a definite place aboard the offshore cruising yacht. Okay, let's show you how we do it. Although we have the capacity to stow our poles vertically, we prefer to keep them on deck, where the weight is lower and the windage is eliminated. As you've already seen, it's not a big deal for us to get the pole onto the mast. 
The key to our system is stowing the pole well aft. That helps the topping lift automatically raise the outboard end. Because the length of the topping lift is fixed, it forces the outboard end up as Steve shoves the pole forward. You can see it happening here in slow motion. Once the butt end is connected to the mast, the pole is totally under control. Next, we bring the spinnaker on deck from the forepeak. The clue is attached to the sheet. And then the after guy is connected to the tack. The spinnaker is hoisted while Steve keeps the alignment stripe from twisting. The ratchet block on the sock control line is then attached to the deck. The friction of the ratchet helps to control the sock if it's blowing. To help the sail fill in these light airs, Steve is tightening the after guy. If it were windier, we'd unfurl the spinnaker in the lee of the mainsail. Now comes our secret weapon. This is the ultimate cruising sail, the mizzen spinnaker. The procedure here is much the same as up forward, except that the luff is attached to the deck with adjustable tackles. In unsettled weather where the big spinnaker is too much sail, this little guy keeps us moving at a very nice clip.
The luff is adjusted between the center line and rail with two tackles. These sails represent a careful balance and design. They are optimized for reaching with just enough draft to keep them stable off the wind. And they're heavy. The big chute is 2.2 ounce, while the smaller spinnaker is 1.5 ounce. This means they're strong enough to take the odd mistake in stride. Take a look at the breeze on the water. It's blowing a steady nine knots, maybe gusting 10. And Sun Deer is averaging just over wind speed, a nice even 10 knots. Here are some computer views of the spinnakers taken from the sail design software at Windward Custom Sails. The first views are the big chute while these are of the mizzen spinnaker. The aerial photographs will give you a different perspective. Dousing the mizzen spinnaker is quite simple. Ease the sheet. Then pull the sock down. and lower the sail to the deck. Being all inboard, even if we're caught in really heavy weather, the mizzen spinnaker is easy to get down. Let the halyard go and it will blow against the mainsail. The technique with the big spinnaker is a little different. First, the sheet is trimmed so the leech lies flat against the main. One more. One more. That's good. You now ease the guy. Then the after guy is eased. Keep going. Ease some more. More. causes the sail to collapse in the lee of the mainsail, after which socking is easy. When it's blowing hard, we run off square with the wind to make the mains blanket more effective. Since it's so light out, we might as well go ahead and show you the dousing system on the main and mizzen. It's really pretty simple. Flake the halyard, bitter end first.
tighten the lazy jacks. And ease the halyard. Four battens and lazy jacks contain the sail well enough so that just a couple of gaskets are required to keep it in place. Handling a boat offshore when there's plenty of sea room has never been a major concern of ours. But in port under power, when things are tight, it's a different story. There are several techniques that can be adapted to give you better control. The first is backing down. We start off slow, allowing Sundeer to gather a bit of sternway so her rudder gets a good bite. Too much power at this point allows prop torque to force the stern sideways. Anytime we're in a really tight harbor, we back into the dock, keeping the bow downwind. When we misjudge something, a quick exit is easy. If you steer facing aft, the wheel will work just like when you're going forward. Turn it the direction you want the stern to go. Now let's try a different approach. We're going to use our stern torque to rotate the boat 90 degrees in tight quarters. Steve is using alternate quick bursts of forward and then reverse. The wheel is hard over to starboard. The forward prop wash pushes the bow to starboard. Then when he reverses, the torque pulls the stern to port. The bursts of power are too short for Sundeer to gather any way.
Here's the same technique, except we're going to spin the boat in open waters. You have to do this in the natural direction of stern torque. In most boats, that's clockwise. If there's a breeze, let it blow your bow to leeward, on the side you want to turn towards. It's usually impossible to fight the wind. Watch how little movement there is, forward or aft, as Sundeer rotates. Using stern torque to rotate is a key tactic when maneuvering under power in tight quarters. And it's just as easy as you see here. Turn the wheel in the direction of rotation and alternate on the throttle with quick bursts of power fore and aft. Here's a diagram of how this works. With the rudder hard over, the first shot reverse pulls the stern to port. Then, the thrust of the prop against the rudder and forward continues a turn. There are times when you will want to moor in such a way as to use stern torque to pull you away from the dock. But the way we brought Sundeer in here, it will hold us against the dock, so we're going to spring ourselves clear. The only problem is that we can't spring out far enough to turn in time when we go down the channel. What I'm going to do is to pull us down the dock with a spring line while holding the stern a foot or so away with little thrusts of forward and reverse. This continues the turn started by backing down against the spring line. Now I've got enough room to use the stern torque rotating technique. Watch how the water boils up, first from a shot ahead, and then from a stern. So far, we've been sailing in pretty light airs, and you're probably wondering how Sundeer does in a breeze. As you'll soon see, the harder it blows, the better she likes it. And compared with other boats, the worse the wind and sea conditions are, the easier she is to handle. There are several factors which make Sundeer so easy to sail when it's blowing. First, she doesn't require a cloud of canvas to keep her moving. Once the breeze gets up, she'll do an easy 10 or more knots with a very modest sail plan. She 
she's moving here at a 240 mile a day clip, broad reaching, with just the working jib, yet it's blowing only 14 to 15 knots. Here we are with a couple of knots more of breeze. It's from a little further aft, but the jib and main and mizzen are still pulling us along at 240 miles a day. As you've already seen, most of Sundeer's sail area is in her main and mizzen. This offers several advantages. First, boomed sails, when properly designed, are efficient over a much wider range of wind conditions than headsails. The draft can be varied from flat to full, and as you sail further off the wind, they maintain a much better airfoil than a jib. And of course, they can be easily reefed if conditions dictate. The question then becomes, what is the most efficient shape? If you throw away handicap rules and add in full battens, the answer is easy. The closer you can come to an elliptical tip shape, the better off you're going to be. That means a sail with lots of roach. These big roach sails are so efficient that Sundeer is actually stiffer with the bigger sails than she would be with a smaller, more triangular shaped sail. The mizzen has seven feet of roach, while the mainsail, restricted by the backstay, has six feet. Even though the mainsail overlaps the backstay by two feet, it still tacks through with ease. Sunbeer's cockpit is compact enough to be secure in the worst sea conditions. Yet we have plenty of room to take care of our sail adjustments. Either primary or secondary winches can be used for sheeting. And the four guy preventer control lines are adjusted through jammers at these winches. Hetzel leads can be adjusted from the cockpit too. Both fangs are adjusted here, while the main backstay and cutter stay are tensioned on the opposite side. The main boom traveler is controlled on the port side. We have the backstay retrievers led to the cockpit. The main and mizzen can be trimmed or eased from on deck or inside the pilot house.
and you can just about reach the jib sheet from inside without getting wet. Chest high stainless guardrails provide an extra measure of security when working offshore. And there are lots of other handholds close by. When we hook up and walk forward, the pilot house is great to hang on to. We try and keep our decks clear of running rigging. Most of it's run outboard the lifeline stanchions. Any of the lines on the main mast can be led through a snatch block to the electric winch. When we're through hoisting, the halyard jammers allow us to transfer back to the mast winch. A power winch has other applications too. Hoisting drums of fuel, going aloft, and retrieving the anchor are just a few of the uses. And for reefing, it can't be beat. We also use it to work the boat onto a dock when the wind or current is making things difficult. A breast line is rigged through an eye amidships. Once this line is on a cleat, Sundeer is under control. This is what we call our magic box. It's the autopilot remote with extra buttons for controlling the electric winches and anchor windlass. With it, just about all our hoisting jobs can be done single-handedly. And in the pilot house, we can steer from wherever it's convenient. Part of the enjoyment of passaging aboard Sun Deer is due to her pilot house. Along with providing shelter from the sun and rain, it's also a very efficient place to stand watch. With radar, VHF, and pilot controls close at hand, we can con from inside and pop outside for a quick look every few minutes. The sight lines from sitting inside to the water in front of the bow are quite good, something that's necessary for spotting debris. When we're cruising in waters where logs are a problem, we use this emergency stop system to get the engine out of gear. The main and mizzen sheets can be trimmed or eased without going outside. The extended forecast for Juneau and central southeast Alaska issued 1 p.m. Alaska Daylight Time Sunday. We close the back end of the pilot house off with these removable plastic windows. And of course there are cockpit drains as well as washboards and a sliding hatch. The interior dimensions are set up so people sitting to windward can brace their feet across the way. Instead of having to go aloft for a good view ahead, we can stand on the pilot house roof. And of course, for furling the main, it makes life a lot easier. Let's 
good. That'll eat us up. The very efficient sails that are possible today make the catch a much more attractive rig than it used to be. Sundeer's mizzen develops almost as much power per square foot as does her mainsail. So we've made the mizzen quite large, reducing the main and forward triangle in the process. This makes the overall sail plan a lot easier to deal with. But the biggest factor in the modern catch is the mizzen spinnaker. It makes such a world of difference in performance and is usable through such a high wind speed range that it's almost reason enough to go to a split rig. We should probably make a few comments about towing dinghies. As you can see, we do tow ours on the occasional short hop if we feel the weather is settled. Of course, you have to be prepared to cut it away if it gets into trouble. When we're sailing downwind at 10 knots or more, it's towed about 20 feet astern. And when we're heading uphill, the painter's pulled up short so the dinghy rides in seas which have been smoothed by sun deer. The towing bridle passes through D-rings on each side of the bow, back to eye bolts on the transom. We use the same walnut shell non-skid strips on the dinghy floorboards as we do on the cabin soles. Sometimes it's the dinghy that does the towing. What do you say we freshen the breeze up a bit and take a look at reefing? The system we use is pretty simple. First, the lazy jacks are tightened. Then the bottom higher jammer is opened. And the higher disease to the reef mark. The bottom jammer is then closed, and when the top jammer is open, the sail begins to drop. While the electric winch is grinding down the clue, I pull a tack line tight. The whole process usually takes less than a minute. Sundeer's reefs are quite deep. That first bite out of the main reduces sail area by almost 20 percent. She's standing up nicely to this reaching breeze and doing a steady 10 to 11 knots.
We're going to crack off now. the wind, Sundare is underpowered with just a reefed main, mizzen, and working jib, but she's still averaging a comfortable 11 knots. trying a jibe with us. The mizzen provides an excellent wind shadow in which to bring the main across. In this moderate breeze, once the wind's dead astern, we can almost pull the main sheet in by hand. As the boom comes close to center, our course is adjusted towards the new jibe. The sheet is eased as the sail comes through, reducing the shock load at the end of the jibe. Because there's no wind shadow, the mizzen's a bit more work. And with Sundeer already heading up on the new jibe, the sail is going to come across quickly. Watch how Steve uses his hand to partially break the mizzen sheet. The jib is the easiest part of this operation. The port sheet is left tight until the sail has blown across the foredeck. Then we begin to tighten up the starboard sheet. When that's about halfway in, the port sheet is freed. This prevents the jib from wrapping around the headstay. We're going to harden up now and close reach for a while. Sundeer is fastest and most comfortable when sailing upwind with very flat sails. To reduce draft, we bend the masts. On the mainsail, we'll tighten the backstay first and then the cutter stay. That's not a lot of bend just about nine inches, but it is enough to get the mainsail almost board flat. We use a running backstay to bend the mizzen mast.
We're almost on the edge of wanting a reef in the mizzen. But because of Sundeer's full-length battens, we can feather the sails to reduce drive. Soft sails would be flogging now, and we'd be forced to shorten down for the puffs. The battens also help when we're reefed. Coupled with the lazy jacks, they reduce the need for cringles to hold the sail onto the boom. There's more to a successful system than a few long battens. Our battens are much stiffer than you'd normally find. Most of them are 5 8 inch solid fiberglass. The front end hardware is made by Batslide. There are eight battens in each sail. The upper ones are rotated almost perpendicular to the leech. That's probably more battens than you're used to seeing. But in combination with the extra stiffness, it's what makes the sails feather so quietly. We also have a full length batten in the jib, just above where the cutter stay intersects the mast. This batten prevents the leech from closing and is especially useful as the sail cloth ages. This jib has almost 8,000 miles on it and it still looks pretty good. Once the breeze gets into the 20s and above, Sundeer moves well with very little sail area. This makes it easy to stay shortened down ahead of bad weather when it's prudent, yet you can still make reasonable and comfortable progress. She's sailing here with just staysail and main. The mizzen's been furled. With the breeze getting into the 30 knot range, we're going to take a reef in the main. It's the same procedure as before, except this time I'm using the magic box to control the reefing winch while Steve works the mast.
were sailing here with less than 950 feet of sail. A really small rig for a boat with a 66 foot water line. Yet we're averaging almost 12 knots. Part of that Sundeer's efficient hull shape and part the drive of the big roach mainsail. Phew, that's a lot of information in sail handling in the last hour. As much or more than we do on the average ocean crossing. Yeah, I'm out of breath just from editing all this footage. That Sunday or likes a fresh breeze is easy to see. But the sad truth is most of our cruising takes place in light airs. In fact, Sunday has been reefed down below working canvas only five times in her entire career. But you do need to know how to handle your boat in the odd blow that comes along. What we've been trying to show you is just how easy it can be to adjust to changes up or down in the wind scale. Before we move on, there are a few details left to discuss on deck. There are jammers built in to the ends of both booms. These help to change winches when we're going from the first to the second reef. Each reef has a continuous downhaul pre-rigged. They make it easy to winch the sail down when conditions are really nasty. When the vang is fully compressed, the boom is supported parallel with the water. It doubles as topping lift and gallows. Goosenecks are notorious weak links, so ours are twice as strong as the norm. This adds only a couple of pounds to the total rig weight, but increases strength tremendously. Those rivets hold in the Vang Doubler. It's six feet long and reinforces the weakest point of the boom. Every cruising boat should have its spreader swept aft to prevent mass pumping. This eliminates the need for forward lowers and helps with headsail sheeting. We seize our pelican hooks shut to prevent accidental opening. And I like to use a solid welded tang rather than wire bales for lifeline attachment. Our lifeline stanchion bases are welded to the deck. This helps stiffen the one and a quarter inch by 32 inch high stanchions. Pad eyes are welded down. Our hardware is bolted to threaded plate, which in turn is welded to the deck, strong and no holes to leak. The chain plates take the highest load of any part of the boat. They're welded to the hull and deck too. Hatch combings are welded too and have round bar lips for easy attachment of storm covers. Heavy weather is very much a relative term. If you're prepared and know your boat, what other folks think is a gale, you'll consider just a fresh breeze. And if the wind's behind you, the occasional gale can be exhilarating.
live for. It's what sailing an offshore yacht is all about. Driving hard downwind in full control, comfortably. It's a high that's hard to match. I don't know about the high, but we're eating up the miles pretty quick. The wind's blowing a steady 30 to 35, with gusts coming through in the low 40s, at about 160 degrees apparent. The seas, almost dead behind us, are running 6 to 10 feet. reef into the mizzen so the spinnaker will fly better with the wind so far aft. And the mizzen spinnaker's luff has been moved to weather to get it into clear air. Sundeer just loves this rig and so do I. Running off like this, the harder it blows, the better we do. Notice how stable Sundeer is. That stability comes in large part from her boat speed. Inside the pilot house, it's warm, totally dry, and cozy. Ooh, there's a good one. This be 17, 17 and a half. When the wind and seas move forward, however, we need to match boat speed to sea size and shape. Right now, it's blowing in the low 30s. There's a bit of a sea running, and Steve's going to hank on the staysail. main and mizzen are feathered as we close reach at four knots into these big seas. The object right now is keeping Steve dry, not boat speed. Watch how Steve's able to move from handhold to handhold as he works the foredeck.
moving at 12 to 13 knots. We're carrying the wind in the sea on the beam. With full main and mizzen, along with the staysail, she's almost ready for a reef. got a steady 40 with gusts coming through in the low 50s. Ever since the breeze has gotten into the 40 knot range, we've been feathering the mizzen. So I guess it's about time to go ahead and drop it. video, you must think we spend a lot of time in heavy weather. The actual amount is quite small. It bears repeating that in all of Sundeer's passaging, she's been shortened down below working canvas just five times. And I'm sorry to report that due to the prevalence of light airs, we've done more cruising with the engine than with the sails. Yet for an offshore passage maker, it's the windier end of the weather scale 
which has to dictate design and preparation. Even though these precautions will rarely be used, it's nice to know that you're ready. When you're set up for heavy weather, normal cruising is much easier. Design details which help in difficult conditions make for simpler, more comfortable, light air cruising. Most designs have a racing or marketing heritage. The racing rules reflect political concessions rather than seagoing reality. And it's the rare marine professional who has had the time to use his or her products offshore. Sundeer's concept is based on function. She is engineered to be comfortable, easy to sail, and safe. There are no compromises in her design. The logic which dictates the way she performs is universal in its application. The first and most critical issue in any offshore yacht is steering control. It's how the yacht steers under adverse conditions which dictates her security in heavy weather and how easy she is to handle under power. There's also the odd whirlpool to deal with. Refactors affect steering. The first is bow shape. This parametric drawing shows you Sundeer's forward sections. The fact that her shape is gently rounded rather than veed makes her easy to maneuver. When she reacts to a puff of wind or wave, this bow shape simplifies the rudder's job. Of course, the steering system must be at maximum efficiency. For this, there's no equal to a spade rudder. Sundeer's is enormous. It's optimized for maneuvering in tight quarters under power, which happens to make it ideal for steering in heavy weather, too. The rudder's set on an 8-inch diameter solid aluminum stock with huge reinforcements in the hull. This system, while a bit heavy, is stronger than any conventional skeg arrangement. It's engineered for groundings rather than steering, and it's been tested plenty of times. Our wheel steering is designed for maneuvering in port. Lock to lock, it's just one and three quarter turns. At sea, we use a dependable WH autopilot. Because this gear is critical to our cruising success, there are two units, each with an independent hydraulic system. With a little input from the person on watch, the pilot will outsteer any human in the heaviest conditions. The final ingredient in steering is hull balance. As you heel to a gust, depending upon how your hull lines are drawn, there will be more or less of a tendency to head into the wind. If there's a slap by a wave at the same time, it's going to be difficult for the rudder to cope. Sundeer's lines are drawn to minimize the heel-induced steering loads to make her rudder's job easier. Equally important, as she heels, the stern stays in the water making the rudder significantly more efficient. Watch what happens now as a 40-knot gust tries to force Sundeer around. She begins to heel slightly, starts to head up, then is driven back on course by the pilot as she accelerates down the wave. The same thing is happening here, only now it's a 50-knot gust on the quarter rather than a stern bow shape, steering efficiency, hull balance, all working together. If they weren't, we'd be forced to reduce speed. And if we slowed down, instead of being rock steady as you've seen, in these seas we'd be bouncing all over the place. When you're driving hard downwind, you don't want to stuff the bow. That can lead to all sorts of unpleasant complications. We solve this problem by eliminating bow overhang and pulling the cutwater forward. Instead of using reserve buoyancy to hold the bow up, we do it with inherent waterline stability. That's what you've been seeing in the shots of Sundeer's bow going through the water. Watch how it's held high as Sundeer drives off these waves.
course there has to be a kicker. That's when you're plugging to windward, under sail or power. But as you've seen, Sundeer has a remarkably smooth motion upwind. Look at these forward lines in plan view. Since the entire hull length is used to support Sundeer's weight, they can be much finer forward for easy wave penetration, yet provide ample buoyancy downwind. Watch how she reacts to this three to four foot chop. Here we're banging into some really big seas, six to ten footers, motor sailing at nine and a half knots. Again, see how smoothly she gets through. There's a major bonus to this besides safety and comfort. That's in staying dry. Go back and look over the video and see how much water you see after the cutter stay. Not much. The soft motion makes it easier to work on deck, too. Finally, we need to discuss keels. With the way Sundeer tracks, you probably think she's got a longish fin, but that's not the case at all. Once again, seeing is believing. Sundeer's keel is definitely not what you'd call long. Yet it obviously gets the job done in a very efficient manner. It also supports our weight when we're hauled. And with just six foot two inches of draft, allows us some interesting gunk holing. While the rig's set up for heavy weather, the vast majority of our sailing is in light to medium airs. Once there are white caps, we can make quite respectable progress with just working canvas. In these conditions, you could shorten Sundeer down to reefed main, mizzen, and staysail, and she'd do 200-mile days with ease. That's hull and rig efficiency working together. Or if we feel a little more ambitious, we could use our light air sails. sums up the design issues. What we've got left to talk about is systems. Our engine room is located all the way aft, behind a watertight bulkhead that isolates the noise and smell and heat from the interior. These are our fridge compressors. They're half horsepower Grunerts, rugged, efficient, and reliable. Each unit cools both fridge and freezer independently. You can use one compressor or both. And if one goes down, the other serves as a spare. This electrodyne alternator is at the heart of our electrical system. It puts out 225 amps at 28 volts. That's over 6 kW. 
the diodes are remotely mounted. Otherwise, we'd have maintenance problems with all the heat they generate. By mating this alternator to a 600 amp, 24 volt bank of Trojan traction batteries, we can go for a week or more at anchor without a charge. This is our sea recovery water maker. Its pressure pump is run by a two horsepower electric motor. The booster pump on top makes the filters last longer. And there's a Y valve in the system so we can use it as a high pressure washdown on deck. That's the damage control pump. It's a 200 gallon per minute self priming centrifugal unit made by MP pumps. There's a suction line that runs to the four peak and the central sump with a final leg here in the engine room. Notice the priming line from the fresh water circuit. Over on the port side, you can see the Webasto diesel heater. It heats up the interior and hot water tank. Because there are two heat exchangers in the domestic water tank, the engine can be used as well. In fact, you can heat the interior with waste heat from the engine. This system, coupled with Sundeer's three inches of insulation, keeps her warm in the harshest weather. This is a special oil cleaner. It not only removes more dirt than a regular filter, but it gets rid of acid too. Over here are dual fuel filters. All three of these units are made by Refineco. We pump the diesel fuel into this day tank. Fuel is automatically pumped up every hour or so, depending how hard the engine's running. We always know there's 10 gallons of clean fuel left to burn. Of course, there's a spare fuel pump in the line too. There's a Halon automatic fire extinguishing system. And while we're talking about fire, take a look at this fuse. It's in the output line of the alternator. There are also fuses in the raw battery feeds. This valve is plumbed into the deck drains. There's one on the other side too. It allows us to divert rainwater from the decks into the tanks. We have a single two inch seacock, which feeds all the raw water for the boat through a manifold. A three quarter inch line is teed off with its own valve to supply the two heads. The tops of the toilet bowls are above the water line. If the check valves ever started to leak, the water wouldn't overflow into the interior. There are only two other holes in the boat. These are both drain pipes, which are welded to the hull bottom and come up above the water line. Our three sinks and two shower sumps are tied to this pump. It sucks from all of them and then dumps the waste overboard. Being a macerator, it chews up the odd bit of hair and food and doesn't need a strainer. One pump, five drains. It's been working now for three years. There are diaphragm type bilge pumps in each watertight compartment. In the engine room, we use three so they can pick up water on either tack as well as when we're at rest. In the four peak, we use a Y valve to convert the bilge pump for a washdown. Of course, if you're into real simplicity, you can wash the anchor down the natural way. Let's talk about engine noise. You'll get the best noise suppression with two inch insulating foam that has a decoupling layer and a one pound per square foot septum. More important is this scatter joint. Can you see that okay? This is like the universal joint in a car. It allows us to use very soft engine mounts. Our main propulsion engine is an Isuzu 150 horsepower, six cylinder diesel. The engine's a bit oversized, but it makes it quieter and reduces maintenance. Having a stop-start button right on the engine really solves some maintenance problems, especially when you're working by yourself. We make it a habit of starting the engine each time down in the engine room. That way, I can come down, check the oil, check the water, have a look at the belts, look for chafe, uh, and then just light the engine off when I'm ready. <laughs> We have eight solar panels arrayed off the push pit. When we're at anchor, they provide 60% of all of our electricity, including refrigeration. This stretches the time between charging to almost three weeks. And we can leave Sundeer unattended for months with the fridge system running and have fully charged batteries when we return. Maintenance is always a big issue with serious cruisers. On Sundeer, we've tried to eliminate as much work as possible by making our equipment accessible and keeping it simple. The biggest advantage is her unpainted aluminum structure. This eliminates a huge amount of upkeep, and we don't have to worry about rafting, dinghy banks, or difficult docking situations. Of course, the option's always open to paint later on.
There are all sorts of ways to go cruising. And whether it's a Tahiti catch or some modern boat you're sailing, keep in mind that the ultimate goal is getting away from the dock. Join us now aboard Sundeer as we sail from Auckland, New Zealand to Tahiti.